So it is the 28th Monday. It's a Monday. And we're going to talk about the elbow, wrist, and hand. And included with that is obviously going to be the radio ulnar joint as well for pronation supination. But we're going to talk through those. I have the old lecture that is up for this, which I posted the new lecture. Both the PowerPoint and the PDF should be up and available. I made sure that I did not make them available for John because John might throw something at me again. Um, but the old lecture was about 90 some slides. I try to compress that down. I think I got it down to like 40 some now. So but I just looked at the old lecture. It was just way too much stuff. And so I condensed it like Campbell's soup down to something. If you hit the chat, already copied and pasted, right? So we're going to start going through each of the joints individually. So we're going to start with the elbow to kind of cover that. So the elbow itself, right, has one degree of freedom because it's uniaxial. It basically does flexion extension, right? And we're talking about the elbow. We're really talking about that joint specifically where the humerus kind of meets up with the radius and ulna, right? Primarily the um, good old olecranon and that whole trochlea and trochlear notch interacting with each other. So it has flexion and extension. The neat thing about the elbow is it also has this thing called the carrying angle. And what the carrying angle is this angle that's formed if you put your arms down to the side in the anatomical position that forms when you look at what happens if I draw a line straight through the body of the humerus and come down and draw a line through the midline of the forearm. It creates this angle here. And in men and women, it's a little different. So with men, it's about five degrees. And then for women, it's about 10 to 15 degrees. Why do you think is men's armor heavy? Okay, so I already had somebody, so I'm like, I didn't even have to say, it. Joe's already jumping on. He's like, why, why? Maybe, I wouldn't go that far. Are men's arms more used to carrying stuff that are heavier? To traditionally, right? And I'm not saying that women can't carry heavy stuff. I'm just saying traditionally in you know development, we've always men have traditionally done heavy work, right? Now that's changing. We are equal opportunity people to make people do slave labor, but traditionally it's been men that do the heavy lifting and the work, right? But the other thing is what what about the hips? What's a little different at the hips for females? So the carrying angle. So this is called the angle that's between. The straight line of the humerus that meets the midline of the forearm down here. So that's what this picture is here. This is the carrying angle. Hips are wider in the female. Yep. And then children, right? Right. So children are a little different as well, right? So mom might have a little bit of a different carrying angle because she's going to swaddle and bring baby in to do what? Breastfeed. Breastfeed, yeah, right? So that carrying angle is a little different from those. Now, I'd be curious if we look in, you know, say 10 to 50 years from now, so maybe 25, 50 years, if those carrying angles are closer now. I'm guessing they're a little bit closer than they've ever been, just because even men are traditionally moving away from heavy labor jobs. And we've got a lot more of repetitive motion jobs than heavy labor jobs. So I would be curious if even that might change a little bit on it. But that carrying angle is going to affect the pull of the biceps and affect the amount of weight each, each uh, gender can lift, right? With the smaller carrying angle, it's a lot easier to do bicepital curls and bring the elbow into flexion than it is when you have a wider carrying angle. It's very similar to the Q angle in the hip. Right? The Q angle is a little different in the men than the females because, again, of childbearing hips. Then we got our radial ulnar joint, and the main job of the radial ulnar joint is pronation and supination. And that's when that good old radius and ulna kind of rotate over each other, right? So primarily that radius rotating over the ulna to give us the ability to go palm up and palm down and palm up and palm down and to grab stuff. And again, this is primarily just of the elbow. We'll obviously talk about the wrist and the hand a little bit. So 
with the joints and the motion, we can actually combine a lot of our motions together to get different functions going on. So here we have kind of a good old fashioned open in a wine bottle, right? And we know that the biceps muscles themselves help with supination and flexion. So in the case of opening a wine bottle, that's a pretty pure biceps motion because you're kind of twisting that wine bottle open and pulling on the cork. Sub supinator and obviously your pronators help with supination and pronation, but the primary mover obviously is that biceps that's doing a lot of the work in the elbow. So for bony landmarks, we do have a few bony landmarks in the scapula we got to worry about. The infraglenoid tubercle and the supraglenoid tubercle are kind of big ones, right? And then we also have that good old corcoid process, right? The corcoid process, which has those tubercles on them. The idea there when we have those is those are going to be muscle attachments for muscles that are going to go across the elbow, right? So the biceps attach out there in the corcoid and the superglenoid tubercle, and then the infraglenoid tubercles where one of the heads of the triceps attaches. So both biceps and triceps are going to be two joint muscles because they're going to cross over the elbow and the shoulder. And really, the uh, biceps almost can be thought of as more of a tri-joint muscle because the, the bicep also works down at the radial ulnar joint as well in pronation supination. At the funny bone and humerus, we've got the trochlea we got to know about, right? The capitulum. And if you've taken us back to anatomy there, right? The trochlea is our spool of thread, right? There's our trochlea. And then our capitulum is our head that's on the end kind of that, of that end of the humerus. And the reason we don't call that another head is because we already have a head of the humerus at the other end. So we came up with another term for it and called it the capitulum. We have our medial and lateral epicondyles where a lot of that epicondylitis is gonna happen at the elbow. We have our lateral supercondylar ridge, which is out here, which is again, it's some more muscle attachment sites. And then our olecranon fossa, where the olecranon is going to slam in. So we got our ulna. I always thought the ulna was a weirdly named bone. I don't know why. Like who thought of the name ulna? I don't know. With the ulna, we've got our olecranon process itself, right? Which is the elbow bone back there. We've got our trochlea notch, which is gonna interact with the trochlea, right? The trochlea is gonna sit in there and allow it to rotate around. Just distal to the trochlear notch, we've got our radial notch, right? Where that radial head is going to sit. And then just distal to the radial notch, we've got the coronoid process. And I always remembered that we had the ulna, so we had the noid process. Then down just distal from the coronoid, we have the ulnar tuberosity. And then we travel kind of all the way down here to get to our styloid process, right? And our ulnar head. Because remember, the ulnar head is distal versus the radial head is proximal. On the radius, we don't have as many kind of bony promises to remember, right? With the radius, we primarily have our head. Just distal to that, we have our radial styloid or radial tuberosity. And then going down from that, we have our styloid process. So all of that's gonna come into play when we move that elbow and that form around. We have to kind of know how those bones interact with each other. More importantly than that, just like at the knee and at the ankle, there are a mess of ligaments. In the elbow, there's a medial and collateral, lateral, or medial and lateral collateral ligaments. Go figure. That kind of makes sense, right? They prevent valgus and varus force of the elbow. There is also this thing called the annular ligament, which kind of holds the radial ulnar joint together. And then moving down, so the, we've got our medial and lateral collateral ligament here. There's our medial, there's our lateral collateral ligament. 
We have this annular ligament, which is the more proximal portion of that radial ulnar joint. And then as we move further down that radial ulnar joint, we end up with this interosseous membrane here. Right, and the interosseous membrane keeps those two bones from surfing or separating, provides some more surface area for attachment of the forearm and muscle, but or wrist muscles. But the other thing it does is it keeps everything nice and tight, right? Because if we had that radius kind of floating out there, we wouldn't have as much function at the forearm. So then we go to the muscles. Again, just kind of an anatomy review. We have up on the deep part of our, our humerus, we have the brachialis, which is our primary, its primary job is elbow flexion, right? We have our biceps brachii, which helps a little bit with the shoulder flexion, helps, it does primarily elbow flexion, and then also is, helps the supination. Then we have our fun one that I, it's really easy to find, is that muscle that pops up out here on the lateral aspect of our uh, forearm, that is our brachioradialis. We get that from doing a lot of hammer curls or pounding 12 ounce weights. I don't know who does that. On the flip side of the humerus, so if we move over, because that brachioradialis does attach up there to that supercondylar ridge, right? Flip side, we go to the triceps brachii. And the triceps brachii is our primary elbow extender. 13, 14. Okay. I, I don't. The, those, those are way beyond my specs. I'm, I'll stick with my 12 verse. I think this is still, I don't think it's still 12. I wouldn't be surprised if Coke made these like 11.5 ounce cans now, since they made the bottles 16.9 and not 20 ounce bottles anymore. That sounds fair. And then down kind of getting a little bit further down in the muscle of the forearm, we have that good old Anconius muscle, which is that weird muscle in the forearm, or in that forearm area, right? We have our pronator teres and our pronator quadratus and our supinator or supinator. All of those are gonna help provide stability and help with that rotation down at the forearm for supination and pronation. So what are some pathologies that can happen at the elbow? The two main conditions we end up with at the elbow are lateral and medial epicondylitis, like by far, when I see a patient come in to the clinic for whatever reason, if it's an elbow issue, most of the times it's medial and lateral epicondylitis. And lateral epicondylitis, tennis elbow, medial epicondylitis, golfer's elbow. And all has to do with the position of holding the racket or holding the golf club, which I'm not even gonna try to demonstrate holding a golf club because no, I, I suck at golf. Uh, one of the previous instructors took me golfing once and said, never come again. So yeah, I just decided that my, my, my limit of golf is mini putt-putt. That's about where I'm at. So when I have a problem with that lateral epicondyle, that lateral side out here, it's primarily my extensors that are irritated. When I have a problem with my medial epicondyle, it's primarily my flexors that are irritated. Because in the elbow, we have two different things called the wads. So in here, we have our extensor wad. And out here, we have our flexor wad. And all a wad means is a collection of gunk, basically, right? If I have a bunch of 20s in my wallet, I have a wad of 20s. Not that I really ever have that, because I have wads of hundreds, obviously, just because, you know, I'm balling like that. The wads are just a collection where everything comes together. So if I've got an irritation with that extensor wad, right, from extending my elbow too much or having it extended too much, right? Yes. Yes, John, you are correct. So flexor for medial, extensor for lateral. Yes. If I have a problem with those wads, in order to kind of stretch them out and get them moving, I have to do the opposite motion, right? So if my problem is with my extensor wad out here that handles a lot of my finger extension and my wrist extension, then I've got to go into what to stretch them. Flex. 
Good. Right. I've got to go into flex. So I'm going to flex my fingers and flex my wrist. So a lot of times when I have problems with that extensor wad, in order to kind of stretch it out a little bit, I'm going to be doing a lot of this. Right now, am I strengthening my finger flexors while doing this? Sure. So John, do I have to, John asked, do we have to have them in certain positions? I mean, it depends upon what I'm doing. A lot of times if I'm kind of working in that extensor wad, I don't even worry about the fingers. I more worry about flexing the wrist down as deep as I can get it. Kind of keeping that wrist flexing down because the fingers are kind of secondary to it. A lot of our motion when worrying about the extensor or the flexor wad are gonna be primarily either wrist motions or like I said, grabbing a ball and working the fingers extensively. So it just depends upon the theory. Um, if I want to kind of get gross motion, I do wrist. If I want to get kind of the finger, more of the finger tendon portions that are on the extensors or the flexors, I either work flexion or extension of the fingers. And then we talked about this briefly. If I need to work kind of that flexor wad and I want to stretch it out, I've got to go into extension. So I may do just pure extension of the wrist or I may put a rubber band around my fingers and open up with that rubber band. But remember when I'm doing that to kind of stretch those out and work the opposite side, I'm also strengthening the opposite side. So if my problem is extension, my extensor wad, and I'm doing a lot of flexion activities, I'm gonna strengthen my flexors, which means I could eventually trigger the reverse side tendonitis. So I've gotta be careful and balance it. Because what I found, at least in the clinic, is if I've got somebody that's predisposed to extensor kind of tendonitis, they often will develop flexor tendonitis if I work them too hard. So I've got to keep it kind of balanced and don't totally stress them out and say, okay, we're going to do 400 of these ball squeezes. And then they're like, man, now my inside of my arm hurts. You're like, son of a gun. Right? But we also know that stuff like ice, is really good for that, specifically ice massage. I really have a lot of good results with the extensor and the flexor uh, tendonitis where I do ice massage in those areas. And usually if I'm doing ice massage, I just put them in a resting position for that. Or the other thing that I've had good results with is pulsed ultrasound and laser. Pew, pew. I just don't know what I do with the sharks at that point. Um, if my clinic has laser, obviously. I have done, um, shockwave on the medial and epicond lateral, epicondyl uh, lateral epicondylitis treatments. But I always find that shockwave in that area is really uncomfortable because those bones are super superficial. And so you start going in there and banging off them with that shockwave unit and they just don't like you very much at all. We can also end up what's called a, uh, an elbow dislocation, which is, you know, you can see the problem right here. That's not supposed to look like that. So we're gonna have to put some, the doc's gonna have to put some distal traction to move that elbow back into place. Or what's called a supercondylar fracture. And that's where the humerus breaks just above the condyles. All of those are common elbow pathologies that you're gonna encounter. Yes, Miss Diana. Oh, I skipped a class, sorry. Okay, John. How does, yeah, how does um, how does one get like a supracondylar fracture? How does it happen? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Well, there's a couple of different ways I've seen it. I mean, I've seen them as part of a fall as well. Um, but a lot of times, the ones I've seen has been direct trauma, where they've taken a baseball bat to that part of the arm, um, or something to that effect. I've also seen them on motorcycle accidents quite frequently where the person ends up going out and they kind of fall on their elbow or something like that. There's not a, again, it's not a specific kind of triggering event that's going to happen to that, but the weakest part of the humerus seems to be in that, just that supercondylar region for some reason. And it's not because it's got less bone. It just seems to be one of the weakest areas that actually fractures seem to occur at. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And it would be much akin to like the lower knee where we actually end up with knee replacements too, right? It's not that very different from that distal femur area. 
So there's the arthro kinematics of the elbow, right? So moving where they're gliding or sliding and then rolling. I know this is a lot of kind of thought process here, but remember in an open chained activity, right? In an open chained activity with elbow flexion extension. So open kinetic chain, you've got this concave surface moving on the convex surface, right? Because that uh, the distal portion of my arm is going to be moving an open kinetic chain. The convex would be the radial head. The convex would technically be that good old trochlear notch. And I'm just talking about elbow. I'm not talking about moving into pronation and supination yet. So an elbow flexion, right? An open kinetic chain. The primary thing is that trochlear notch moving on the trochlea. Does that make sense? Yes. How, how would I make an, oh, one second, Brooke, hold on. Let me, maybe this will answer your question in a second. How would I change elbow flexion or extension into a closed kinetic chain? Push-ups, that's a good, that's an excellent example, right? Or chair push-ups, right? That'd be another one. Pull-ups could be theoretically too. Yep, pull-ups would be another one, right? They're not just for kids. <laughs> Push-up plus, good. All right, so any of that, at that point now, if I'm, so if I'm pushing up from my chair here, my ulna and radius are fixed and it's actually my humerus that's doing the movement. So at that point, it's a vex on a cave surface moving. All right, Ms. Brooke, what was the question before I shut you down? <laughs> no problem. For, okay, so for this one, you said that it's um, the humerus, the head of the humerus. No, 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 not the head of the humerus. Just the humerus moving on. So an open kinetic chain, the ulna is moving on the humerus. All right, so let me get rid of my, all my scribbles there. So an open kinetic chain, whether I'm going either way, flexion or extension, uh -huh. right? The ulna is the bone moving, right? It's out in the air. It's the one moving. Okay. So at that point, it is the concave surface of the trochlear notch moving on the convex surface of the trochlea, okay. rotating around. Okay. And then if I go to a closed kinetic chain, so again, I'm going to erase this. And now I move to a closed kinetic chain. Now the humerus, because now my, this is fixed. This area cannot move. It's fixed. Now the humerus is doing the movement. In that point, it is now the convex surface of the trochlea moving on the concave surface of the trochlear notch. So what would a question like that look like? You would have, if it's asking for like a roll spin glider, an arthrokinematic motion, right? Because that's what they're going to, they're going to use this big term. With the arthrokinematics of the elbow, with the patient performing a bicep curl, at that point, what you've got to do if you have a board question is go, oh, bicep curl, that looks like this. That means my ulna and radius are the bones moving. That means it's my trochlea moving on the tro or the trochlear notch moving on the trochlea. It's open kinetic chain. That means it's cave on vex. Or I would say with the arthrokinematics of the elbow, during elbow extension in push-up position, and you're going, oh, push-up. Well, now my radius and ulna are pretty fixed and it's my humerus moving. So then I have the vex on the cave. That help clarify things? Yes, I think I was just confused with the picture for a second. That's, oh, it's okay. That's, it gets a lot of problems that I see a lot of people mistaking is they think that the movement is actually back here at that olecranon fossa and it's the olecranon moving on the olecranon fossa. It's yeah, not yeah. the case. That's just the lock. That's all that is. That's kind of the key in the lock. Okay. The actual movement's occurring here in the, antecubital fossa, right? It's occurring where that trochlea is sitting on that trochlear notch. Uh, okay, that's where I think I got confused. Yep, and John, see, John was gonna ask about the same thing, right? That when, 
And when you get that, because that's for that's so you know, when you're looking at this, the first thing you're like, oh my god, oh it's the Olacron. Just forget the Olacron. The Olacron is just the key in the lock, right? So when I'm in extension, it's locked in. When it's open, it's unlocked. That's all that Olacron is there for, is to give us a little bit more force and extension. We won't be able to like we won't be able to get like questions about like you know the roll glide spin on um on the olecranon and the faucet, correct? No, no, absolutely not. No, it's just gonna talk about general motions because there's really not a motion specific for that, John. Mm -hmm. So it will say just our schematics of the elbow, the ulna is moving which way on the humerus. That'll be kind of what it'll say. Okay. And that's the point. It's just the, the trochlear and the trochlear notch is all we're worried about. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So now, with the forearm, you are unlikely on your boards to get a question about the arthrokinematics of pronation supination. So I'm going to say that. When I say unlikely, I'm talking maybe one in a 10,000 chance of getting it. Because there's some arguments there, depending upon who you're talking about, whether we're looking at the distal end or whether we're looking at the proximal end for motion. Yeah, not really. Uh, I haven't heard of one student getting a question on that, John. So that's why I'm just saying, uh, the only reason I say that there is a chance out there is because, you know, some mean person could have wrote a question on that. Because if we go back here real quick, let me go back a couple slides here. This is the reason I'm saying that. If we go back here, right, the reason why I say there's probably not going to be a question on that is because when we have motion going on, up here, the radius is a vex head moving on a cave surface of the ulna. Down here, it's reversed. So now I've got a vex part of the ulna moving on a cave surface of the radius. That's why most times they're not going to ask you a question because then they really have to specify, are we talking about the distal radial ulnar joint? Or are we talking about the proximal radial ulnar joint? By the time you get there, the question is too long. Does that make sense for everybody? Because there's two different things that go over that, right? You know, let, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this for an example here. And again, this is not to, don't think I'm going to give you a question like this. But if I was going to write a question about this, what I would have to say is in open kinetic chain, because we can't close kinetic chain pronation supination. Like I have yet to figure out a way unless we're doing like the, I don't know if you've ever seen those. No, that's what you be close kinetic chain. There's no way to do close kinetic chain pronation supination. I am really trying to think. That's why it's going to be almost impossible to write a question for it. Uh, I don't think, there, but this, uh, let's just say it's open kinetic chain. If I was writing a question, I was saying in open kinetic chain motion of pronation and supination, I would have to say the radial head at the proximal radial ulnar joint is doing what? And then you go, oh, the radial head is a convex surface, right? And the ulnar the radial notch is a concave surface. Oh, so that's what it's going on. That's why there won't be a lot of questions on that. It's just way too complicated to ask questions. Now, if any of you decide to go for your hand therapy certification, you know, because I'm looking at, you know, Anthony there, he's going to become a hand, therapy, a hand therapist assistant really fast. They may ask you questions like that on the hand therapist exam because they expect you to know that. But for the general boards exam, no. So I hope that makes it simple. Like when we're talking about arthrokinematics at the elbow, we're just going to be talking about flexion extension. So that's just the trochlea on the trochlear notch. So of the elbow itself, open packed position is about 70 degrees of flexion with about 10 degrees of supination. So this is my full pronation, right? 10 degrees of supination is about here. So, you know, just a little bit off of it and about 70 degrees. So just before I, so here's 90, right? There's 90 of flexion. So 70 is out here. So kind of in this position here, that's my pure open pack position of the elbow. 
good news is with the elbow, as long as you are not in full extension, you can mobilize the elbow. So the only problem you'll ever encounter the elbow mobilizing it is the patient's locked out and that olecranon's locked in the fossa. You can't mobilize them. I can't do anything at that point. So about 70 degrees of flexion is the, the golden rule. And then, you know, 10 degrees supination, sure, whatever. Um, I can't really think when I'm in the clinic that I actually pay attention too much to the supination when I'm doing elbow mobs. I just kind of get them out of extension and kind of mobilize them there. With capsular patterns, again, this is the thing that seems to be nailing a lot of you guys. With capsular patterns, when we, ca again, the only thing capsular patterns tell us is if we need to do joint mobs or if we don't need to do joint mobs, right? So with a capsular pattern of the elbow, the patient is going to be lost, have lost flexion. So they're gonna lose the ability to bend the elbow. If they have a loss in extension, most times that is musculoskeletal, and most times that's a tightness of the bicep more than it is a capsular pattern. Is there a chance again that you have loss of extension and it's capsular? I mean, sure, there's a chance for everything. If there's a chance tomorrow that I could win the lottery, I would have to play the lottery, but there's a chance. And does anyone ever find that ironic that we can gamble everything else here in Nevada, but we don't have the lottery? Just saying. It's kind of funny, right? I come from a state where lottery is like the hugest thing in the world. I gotta get my scratch offs. I can't tell you how much money my like uncles have blown on those stupid scratch off tickets. Anyway, side note. So with the forearm, it, again, capsular pattern in the forearm is equal loss of pronation and supination. If you're not going 10 bucks, once. I think that's the most I've ever won too. And I've probably spent more than you've ever spent because when you're poor, that's how you get rich, right? You just keep spending money on the lottery. Isn't that what they tell you? And all that does is make you more poor. It's a whole, whole scientific study on that. That's beside the point. It's getting way off topic here. But I guess technically you're doing elbow flexion extension as you're scratching or smacking yourself in the forehead for buying him. So with the forearm, it's typically an equal loss of pronation and supination. Oftentimes, if I see a capsular pattern of the forearm, I see them kind of stuck in this mid range where they can't really pronate, they can't really supinate, they kind of get stuck in the middle. It's kind of like Malcolm, it just gets stuck in the middle. No? Okay, appreciate it, John, thank you. Great show, great show. But right into breaking bad. All right, so goniometry of the elbow and goniometry of the forearm. For full range of motion of the elbow, it's about 150 degrees. Remember, if I'm looking out here, I put my arm out to the side, get my guns out here. Guns are shrunk. I got to get back to the heavy lifting. That's about 90 degrees of elbow flexion. So it says you should have about 150 degrees. And I'm sure if I do passive, I probably can get there. But what's the most time, most time going to limit patients more than the actual motion? It's going to be soft tissue approximation, right? You're going to get either the biceps on the forearm or you got chonk forearms like I have and those chonk forearms get in the way. Uh, those are from doing freaking fingertip pushups all my life. So 150 degrees, elbow is really easy. Extension is zero, right? If you go past zero, you're in what? Hyperextension, good, Riley, good. Pronation and supination is fantastic. It's really easy to remember, it's 80 degrees. Woohoo! that one's easy, right? Thank God one of them is easy. And then we've got all these ranges of motion for functional. Here's what I'll say to this. Do not spend a ton of, and I, I think I forgot to mention this last time. Do not spend a ton of time studying these range of motions that are functional. The only ones that I would say study that are functional are of the legs because those are for gait. For the upper extremities, you can kind of think logically through them, right? If I'm going to use a phone, 
if I'm not going to use on speakerphone, we're talking about using a phone like this, I have to be able to bring the phone up to my ear, right? So I have to either have a lot of shoulder motion or a lot of elbow motion, right? I have to have some pronation, some supination to kind of pick it up and bring it up to my ear. To open a door, I have to have a certain amount of motion, right? Drinking out a cup, all of those are there. And then people are going to ask me, well, Mr. McKeever, why do I have functional motion for sit to stand in the elbow? Well, because a lot of people sit to stand by pushing up. So I've got to have some functional range of motion in those elbows. If you should get a board question about functional range of motion of the elbows or the forearm, the questions are going to be self-explanatory. They really are, right? They're going to ask you which of the following is a functional range of motion for a patient to open a door of elbow flexion. And it would be like 190 degrees of elbow flexion, you know, 115 degrees of elbow flexion, 40 degrees of elbow flexion, five degrees of elbow flexion. Well, 40 makes sense. That gives me the ability to reach and open a door. All those others, man, like how am I opening a door like this? Or how am I opening a door with my elbow fully extended? Because I have to have some functional flexion in order to do rotation, right? If you extend your elbow, it's a lot harder to get into pronation supination than it is with a little bit of flexion. So don't spend a ton of time there, Diana, studying all those numbers or Brooke. Focus more on studying these. Right? Know your norms. So here's all the goniometry for that. In order to, or first of all, manual, I forgot. Uh, yeah. So the first part is supposed to be manual mass testing. I totally forgot to put a header there. I apologize, but it makes sense. Manual mass testing, flexion of the elbow, seated. Right? It's in the sagittal plane. So that means if I want to. Convert it to anti-gravity, I put myself into, and it's a sagittal plane motion, sideline, good, right? That should get you through a lot of your questions. If you're like, position for anti-gravity motion of whatever, you're like, sagittal plane, sideline. That's a really golden rule for you, right? Almost every sagittal plane motion goes to sideline for gravity eliminated, or what I call gravity reduced, so two, one, zero. Extension, you're going to do on prone so the patient can come out like that with the elbow. But I'm going to be 100% honest. Most of the time that I test in real life, I test it out here. Like we tested in anatomy. You remember when we tested that in anatomy with kind of the chicken wing exercise? In real life, that's the way I test my elbow extension, right? Key thing about elbow extension, just like the knee. Don't let your patient lock that olecranon in. Because once I lock that olecranon in, I can lock that and hold it against your resistance from just bone on bone. So you're going to want to come out, fully extend it, slack off a little bit. Now it's pure muscular. It's not bone on bone. Now I've got a little bit of muscular resistance. Does that make sense to everybody? Does everyone understand what I'm kind of saying? Are you guys getting what I'm putting down? Okay, good, right? Just don't let any, pretty much any of the joints, you don't want to fully lock those joints out into whatever they are because that allows some bone on bone contact to resist you, right? And some guy at the gym's gonna be like, yo man, I'm swole, watch, try to push my elbows down. Well, yeah, your elbows are bent, idiot. Put them like this and see how far I can push in. Um, one other thing is if you're testing both sides, don't make them do both sides at the same time. That puts a lot of strain on the shoulders and it's really uncomfortable. I've seen some clinicians do that where they're like, okay, put your elbows out, straighten them out, relax a little bit. Now don't let me push you down. So now I'm pushing down on both of these and that puts a ton of strain up on that upper trap and patients aren't gonna like you very much. Pronation supination is not part of your comps. Okay, so whoo, right? But it's usually done in short seated where you're just gonna have the patient kind of elbow here, pronate, and then supinate and resist whichever way you go. We're not really worried about um, gravity at that point. The gravity resistant and gravity dependent are the same. We're not really concerned because pronation and supination is not really an anti-gravity motion where flexion extension is. Goniometry, 
Flexion of the elbow is typically done in supine so that I can have my arm straight down to my side. My fulcrum is the lateral epi of the humerus. Midline of the humerus is my fixed arm. And my motion arm is going to go down here with the midline of the radius using my radial styloid as kind of my distal point. Good news is for extension, it's the same thing, right? But extension, all we want to do is have the patient be able to get back to what? Zero, right? And if we notice they go past it, like we may check Christina and maybe Christina's got five degrees of hyperextension. I don't know, right? Or somebody in here was going to have hyperextension. I guarantee it. Like I said, the worst was like, I think it was 25 degrees I saw and I think it was cohort six. Somebody had that and it was just like, okay, you're an alien. Stop that. Pronation and supination. I'm not going to test you on this because again, this is more of a hands therapist specialist type motion. And the main reason is, is because when you're testing it, so pronation, supination, you're going to use the fulcrum as being the lateral, pro, lateral region of the arm, proximal, so it should be the radial styloid process. I don't know why I put ulnar, but it's basically, you're going to put that kind of right here, proximal to the process. You're going to lay one arm parallel to the midline of the humerus with it kind of going like this. So it's going to go straight down or perpendicular to the floor is usually what I see. And then the moving arm just kind of, you can't see here, the moving arm just kind of lays across my uh, forearm. Where's my, I always lose my goni. I don't know where my goni is at this point. It's gone. The ghost took it. That dang ghost. Um, oh, wait. I got another one. So kind of, if you're measuring this, that's why I don't like pronation and supination testing. I'm obviously gonna have my arm bent at 90 degrees. I'm just putting it out here. I kind of put my arm like this and then I let it roll over and I measure it that way. It is not an exact science. I do not like using these for pronation and supination. For pronation and supination, if I have to test them in the clinic, I use a bubble goni. And we're gonna use those on the spine and I'll demonstrate them when we get to the spine. But a bubble goni, basically you just sit on the end of the wrist and it has fluid in it. And as I supinate, that fluid moves. And then I can take a range of motion based upon how much that fluid moves. It's kind of like a level, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it is almost actually exactly like a level. It's just, it has a arc for the, the fluid to move and you can measure. So if I start at zero and I go down and now my fluid has moved down to you know 60 degrees, I can then say they've got a 60 degree range of motion. I'll bring up a picture of a bubble goni then in a few minutes. So again, I am not gonna ask you a test question about those. I put them on there in case you wanted to were a curious person. Yeah, thank you for the bubble goni. Um, inclinometer is I think the technical term for them. I just call them bubble gonies. It's kind of like bubble guppies. That's it for the forearm and the elbow. The wrist, motions, flexion. Extension, ulnar, radial deviation, sit. The primary joints we're dealing with are the radiocarpal joint. The ulna doesn't articulate very much with the wrist itself. The ulna is kind of like the fibula when it gets down there. It's just there for stability. The radius does most of the job kind of like the tibia does in the ankle, if that makes sense. It's kind of reversed, right? Because down in the ankle, the tibia is medial <clears throat> and does most of the strength of the ankle joint. Here, it's just kind of reversed. And we also have that mid carpal joint kind of down there between those carpal bones. Oh gosh, remember this? Some lovers try positions that they can't handle, right? So we always start from that lateral aspect and start with that scapoid, right? Scapoid, lunate, Lunate meaning moon shaped. Triquetrium. That's why I like tri because that helps me remember triquetrium. There's my pisiform, right? Positions. And the, so the trapezoid and the trapezium are always ones that get me. 
Because I'm like, is it the trapezoid or the trapezium that comes first? And what I always remembered is I swing on a trapeze into my second digit. So my thumb swings on a trapeze into my second digit. Does that make sense to everybody? See what I'm kind of saying? So the trapezium is my most kind of far out bone there, right? So then I go, try positions that, right? Yeah, true, it does come alphabetically, you're right. I didn't, that, shut, stop being logical, Riley. <laughs> I like my swing on a trapeze. Try positions that they can't handle. The capitate is our big bone. What does capitate mean again? Because you have a capitulum in the elbow. They mean the same thing. So what's capitate mean? What do you think? To guess. Head. Yeah, that's all it means. It's the head of the hand. And if you look at it, it kind of is head shaped. And then you have the hamate. And the one thing important about that handmade out here is this little part out here. Does anyone know what this part out here is called? I'll change colors a little bit. Captain. Captain, Captain, Captain. What's that little point out there called of the handmade? Does anyone know? That's the hook. The hook of the handmade. Good. Thank you, Stephanie. Good. And I see you're backing in. I, I'm sorry if you're having internet problems. I, I was having them earlier, so... Don't sweat it, right? So there's a little canal here that forms between the hook of the hamate and the pisiform, right? And there's a little canal that forms down here as well. Hamate does look like a hammer. Yep, it looks like the head of a hammer. So that's our carpals, right? Oh my God, look at this hot mess. Good freaking grief. That is... Do you want to be a hand therapist yet, Daniela, looking at that? Because you have to know all those if you want to be a hand therapist. That's a lot of ligaments, right? So leave that to OT, exactly. So the good news is the ligaments, much like the ankle, are just named for where they go and where they start, right? If I have a palmar radiocarpal ligament, it's going from the palm and it's going to cover the space between the radius and the carpal bones. Ulnar collateral ligament is going to be on what side, do you think? Yeah, the ulnar side. Good, right? Just like radial collateral ligament will be on the radial side. Uh, the palmar ulnar carpal ligament goes from the palm and the carpal bones to the ulna. So the good news is, all of them are pretty much labeled for where they are going through. So don't totally lose your mind and go, oh my God, if I get a question on these, I'm going to freak out. Don't. Most of the time, what they're going to ask you about, if they ask you anything on the boards, is these two out here, the ulnar or the radial collateral ligament. And why are they going to ask you about that? They're going to ask you about either a varus or a valgus stress on them meaning a lateral stress or a medial stress on the wrist. And you just have to think, oh, well, if I'm going this way, right? If I get a stress from the lateral side pushing medial, my wrist is gonna go like that. My medial ligament or my ulnar ligament is gonna get stretched. If I go the other way, my radial ligament or my lateral ligament is gonna get stretched. That's it. They're not gonna make you, I mean, unless they decide to be really mean. But then again, most of the other ones are just named for where they go. You also have this articular disc, which is part of this triangular fibrocartilage complex or the TFCC. And the TFCC kind of sits down here. So, okay. Hands here, right? Varus. So if I get a varus stress, right? My knees are going to go wide, same thing in my wrists. So I'm going to get very wide wrists. So that's going to stress my lateral ligaments. If I get a valgus stress, I'm going to be pushing inward, just like the knees. So don't let that change. Does that make sense? 
I would say more so for so for varus stress, you're more getting more radial deviation, hands in anatomical position. Exactly, Truman. So you're getting more of a radial, radial motion. Does that make sense, Truman? Or who was it that asked that? Uh, sorry, John. Yeah. So it's going to be more about radial and ulnar deviation than it is supination or pronation. So that's okay. Yeah. Now don't think about the form. So, if, okay. Right. So if I get a force that moves me into ulnar deviation, this area is getting stretched out. Right. So that means my hands in anatomical position are moving laterally. I'm getting a very wide wrist area, so it would be a varus stress. Whereas if I get in, oh, I don't know how you would even get a lot of radial motion there, but a radial deviation where those kind of, my medial bones come together, right? I get knock knee, I'm getting a valgus stress. Again, don't get too hung up on those because the likelihood of you getting a question, you're more likely to get a question about the varus and valgus of the knee than you are ever to get a varus and valgus of the wrist. TFCC is this really kind of important cartilage complex down here that provides cushioning at the wrist, right? So triangular fibrocartilage. Why is it called triangular fibrocartilage? Because it's triangular in shape, bing, bing, bing. It's almost like a um, meniscus of the wrist is a good way of looking at it. And it provides that cushioning surface. Palmar fascia is what muscle tightens up the palmar fascia? Do you guys remember? What muscle is responsible for tightening that palmar fascia? Palmaris longus. Good, right? What's unique about the palmaris longus? Does anyone know what's unique about it? Not everyone has it. Yeah, that's it. Not everyone has it. Or someone like me, if I can tighten up, I can't see if I, you can get an anomalous, I can't get the show today. I have an anom uh, anomalous strain of my palmaris long, not strain, but actual like ligament or tendon of my palmaris longus that I kind of, my palmaris longus splits. And so the palmaris longus is just one of those weird muscles that does weird things. It's kind of like, what would that relate to your splits too? Yeah. What would that relate to? So that the actual muscle, so like the tendons going back to the muscle belly itself forms two different muscle bellies. It's an anomalous feature that happens at about like 10% of the population. It's just a weird thing that happens. Or the other thing that happens is you could end up with a wrist that doesn't have a palmaris longus. What muscle does that correlate to in the foot? Plantaris. Plantaris, good, right? It correlates with plantaris because plantaris's job is tightening the plantar fascia. Did I just blow anyone's mind? See how we're correlating them? Oh, John's like, yeah. Now it kind of makes sense, right? If a patient has a pro is missing their palmaris longus, are they going to be able to do everything that a normal person does? Yeah. Because you've still got finger flexors. And you've still got all your intrinsics to your hand. It's just a, it's just one of those muscles. I, I'd love to know what the, um, it's kind of like the appendix. It's one of those that may not be as needed as it was maybe when we were walking around on all four legs or all four limbs. I don't know. Cats have a very, very strong palmaris longus because it also attaches the sensory pads of their paws, right? And we all know that cats are really sensitive, right? Do you ever try to pet a cat's paw and then get your hand torn apart by trying to pet it? Right? Just like murder mittens, exactly, right? Just like if a cat lays on its back and gives you its belly, it obviously wants you to pet its belly, right? What is it Admiral Akbar said in uh, Star Wars? It's a trap. All right, so the muscles of the wrist. Yeah, I only had one cat that ever liked this belly pet. And then it would only like its belly pet as long as, yeah, two pets only anymore is taken as a threat. That's what I was gonna say, Truman, right? Yeah, a couple pets, and then it's, you know, it's drawing blood time. So muscles of the wrist. On the anterior part of the wrist, we have our flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor carpi radialis, and palmaris longus. 
right? And what I was saying about that weird split that John and I were mentioning with this Palmaris longus here is some people have some a weird section of Palmaris longus that kind of goes like that. It doesn't affect anything. It doesn't make Palmaris longus any stronger. It just does a weird split. You know, I don't know. Maybe we we weren't we held the bottles too much as babies. I have no idea. On the posterior side, we have our extensor carpi radialis longus. Our extensor carpi radialis brevis. No, it just makes us become Iron Man or Spider Man better. So that's where our webs are eventually going to shoot out of, John. And then our extensor carpi ulnaris. So anterior side, usually our flexors. And our posterior side, usually our extensors. Makes sense. Pathology of the wrist, and the, the wrist and what covers some of the hand as well. Most of that we covered in that 1205 lecture. Most of that will then be covered in depth with Dr. Reskin next semester in 207. So I gave you kind of the top level view. She's really going to dig down into it and how to treat hand issues and wrist issues. With the wrist, open pack position is neutral, meaning my hand kind of rests like this with just a little bit of ulnar deviation. How much? Yeah, just a little. It's kind of like a smidge. Closed pack is extension and ulnar deviation. That's fully closed pack. But if you read most of the books, what they'll say is full extension and full flexion are both closed pack positions because the bones can't move, right? But just kind of resting here is where I'm going to mobilize most of my joints. And I can get in and probably mobilize most of your capitates if I'm kind of resting in neutral. Capsular pattern to the wrist, equal loss of flexion and extension, slight loss of radial or deviation. Here's the deal with the wrist. Almost every time that we have a wrist issue, we are going to mobilize the wrist. It's very similar to the ankle. A lot of times we're going to mobilize the ankle frequently, um, but the wrist is definitely one where if we have loss, we're going to mobilize the wrist because it, we lose both typically in a capsular pattern. Now, if I just lost flexion for whatever, or just lost extension, I can't extend back, that's going to be musculoskeletal. If I just lost flexion and can't flex down, that's going to be musculoskeletal. But if I've lost a little bit of both, it's probably capsular. So I'm going to mobilize that wrist. Oh God, look at these functional range of motions. What did I say about those again? They're there for your knowledge. Do not memorize them. Please do not load your brain with that. Just don't. We'll come up with some theories on how to go through that when we get to test prep. But you do have to know these. When I'm looking at these, for the most part, and I'm prepping for my boards or prepping for a test, I just kind of remember that flexion and extension is about 75 degrees and ulnar and radial deviation is about 25. And then I just remember that I flex and ulnar deviate more than I extend or radially deviate. That was my way of getting through this when I was doing this because I was just like, man, which one's 70, which one's 80? I just remember them kind of both at 75. Because then you can answer most of your questions. I'm not going to give you a question where it's like, extension of the wrist is 71 degrees, 70, 69, or 73. No, I'm going to give you a pretty broad ranges. You know, I'm going to say the flexion of the wrist, your options with flexion of the wrist is going to be, you know, 80. 95, 105, or 20. And that's when you go, well, 95, man, that's past there. 105 is way past that. 20, oh, no, I'm not getting any range of motion. My only option is 80. There are logical ways to solve these problems. All right, again, I didn't put the headers on here. God dang it. Manual must testings first, goniometry second. Wrist flexion and extension are both going to be tested and short seated with the wrist on a tabletop or on an arm of an armrest. I don't know if my armrests go any higher. No, they don't. So if I can tilt my camera down, we'll see. There we go. Arm of an armrest. 
So we're gonna have the patient extend back. We're gonna push them down or we're gonna turn the palm over, have them come up, push them down for either flexion or extension for manual muscle testing. The gravity eliminated, we just turn this wrist this way and test them this way. For ulnar and radial deviation, three, four, five, two, one. I don't know, how did I organize them like that? I think I just copied and pasted, sorry. So five, four, three, two, one, zero is all tested here with the arm kind of in this position where we just go side to side. We don't test them against gravity. It just go, if they got motion, great. We got three. If we get some resistance, four. If we get full resistance, five. You're not gonna be doing those for class because it's really easy to cramp a patient. Wrist flexion goniometry. We're gonna test in short seated again. In flexion, we're gonna have the palm up. The, go, the uh, fulcrum, there we go, I can speak today, is at the lateral aspect of the wrist at the triquetrium. Most clinics use ulnar styloid process or radial styloid process. So whichever you're measuring off of. So triquetrium would be over here anyway but most of them use that styloid process as their measurement. I guarantee if you ask a clinician, they're gonna tell you it's a styloid process. And they're gonna be wrong based upon the boards, but most of us use styloid processes because they're easier to find than where the freak is the triquetrium. The fixed is gonna go along the midline of the ulna. The movement is gonna go out the hand to the distal head of the fifth metacarpal. So it's gonna go parallel to that fifth metacarpal, right? And run out to that distal head. Now, the one thing I'll say about that, do not confuse your nice big hypothenar eminence as your fifth metacarpal. You gotta get in there and palpate so you can find that fifth metacarpal and find that fifth metacarpal head. So we've gotta definitely get palpation. Uh, same thing for the wrist extension, same motions. Ulnar and radial deviation, you're gonna do it kind of palm down and you're gonna test them either way. You're not gonna do it again for class, but if we're ever doing, if you're ever doing it in the clinic, your fulcrum is gonna be your capitate. You can feel that head of the hand here, that's capitate. Your fixed arm is gonna go dorsal midline of the forearm, and then it's gonna go out to my dorsal midline, my third metacarpal, so out to my middle finger using that med head as kind of my distal range. I'm just gonna measure one way and measure the other. Again, we're not gonna do that for the comps or practice, but that is radial and deviations there in case you need it for your clinic. All right, last thing is the hand. So somebody give me a hand. Ah, look, a round of applause. So joint motions at the hand, we are gonna talk about the thumb or the fingers. And then the rest of the phalanges, right? So we have the thumb and the rest of the phalanges. The thumb, right? We have carpal metacarpal motion. So carpal metacarpal here, we have flexion extension, right? So when we're looking at here, we go this way, flexion extension, right? We have ab and adduction of the thumb. And then we have opposition where we rotate the whole way around. And opposition can count for all fingers. It's opposition is touching a thumb to one of the fingers. Because I always get this question, I've had this question before, well, how can a patient do opposition if they've had the pinky amputated? They can still do opposition there. Or if they're one of those drinkers where they drink with their pinky out. I'm gonna hold my tea, my tea. At the metacarpal, phalangeal joint, I flexion extension. At the IP, I just have flexion extension. I have some accessory motion there where it kind of wobbles in that joint as well because of it's the being the Pringles joint. But for the most part, it's just flexion extension. Well, I kicked up some stuff there. Out of the fingers, e fingers, fingers. Carpal, metacarpal joint. We have some accessory motion and it also helps with closing off for opposition. Metacarpal phalangeal are traditional knuckles. We have flexion, extension, and we can get some hyperextension. Like I can get some real hyperextension here on my index finger 
or my pinky, but not all of us have hyperextension. We only really need to get to there. We also have ab and adduction of thumb fingers, opening and closing. And then out at the PIPs and the DIPs, rad round, rad round. Wait, no, sorry, just flexion extension. I'm doing good. Did I freak anyone out yet? I'm trying. So the bones and the landmarks are just like, pretty much just like the foot, right? We have our carpal bones back here, right? So our carpals interacting with our metacarpals forms our carpal metacarpal joint. When we get to the metacarpals, we have the base and we have the head. And then what's this mid part called again? Shut your mouth. Just kidding. Somebody will get that. Talking about the shaft. Appreciate it, Cindy. Somebody got it. I, I occasionally get some jokes in there that no one gets. Sometimes you guys get them. Right? So we got our base, our head, and our shaft of our metacarpals, where the metacarpals meet the phalanges. We have our metacarpal phalangeal joint. And then once we get out to the phalanges, we have our base, our head, and our shaft, our base, our head, and our shaft. The thumb is the only one to have just an IP joint, or technically it's a DIP joint, but we don't talk about the D. It's just an IP. In the other fingers, we have the PIP joint, proximal interphalangeal joint and the distal interphalangeal joint. The further we move out, the babier the bones get. Right, tinier the bones get. Get old anatomy review here. I'm sure you're all excited about this. The ligaments and fascia of the hand. We have two primarily different fascias. We have a, a retinaculums, they're called. There's a flexor retinaculum and an extensor retinaculum. There is also a palmar carpal ligament and a transverse carpal ligament. So the retinaculums, what I like to think about the retinaculums when I'm thinking about those is the retinaculum's job is to keep the carpal tunnel closed and to keep the backside of the wrist closed. So if I'm on my palmar side here, is this gonna be my flexor or my extensor retinaculum? Flexors. Flexor, because it's on the same side as the muscles, right? Yeah, I'm going to flexion. So this is my flexor. So my flexor retinaculum sits over my carpal tunnel. My extensor retinaculum sits in the same spot, just on the back side of my hand. And what that does is as these tendons come down, it keeps them tight to the bone. What do you think they do in carpal tunnel surgery? Yeah, there you go. Anthony was already on it, right? That retinaculum is what they're going to cut open in carpal tunnel surgery to give more space to the carpal tunnel. Now, the downside to that is when they cut that, right, that makes everything a little bit more exposed. And kind of swelling can push things out and it can get all kinds of funky stuff there. So they don't totally cut it but they will kind of loosen it. And sometimes they will completely cut it out depending on what they're doing because they say, well, I don't have to worry about that because I still have my transverse carpal ligament up here holding my hand in place. So it just depends. So they'll cut right down the middle there and give that carpal tunnel a little bit of space. So if I cut it right there, that gives this a little bit more room to breathe. The other thing that you need to know about the hand, it, yeah, I mean, it doesn't have a ton of blood supply, right? But there, the blood supply is there. And again, they're not really showing, they're showing more of the tendons and the ligaments here. But there are blood vessels that go down through here as well. They kind of fit in those little spots there. And then we've got some superficial blood vessels going either side, right? I can pinch off either side of my hand 
and I can actually make blood get cut off to my hand. The other thing you have to kind of think about is the structure on the back of the finger called the extensor hood, right? This is not to be confused with the red hood from Batman, but the extensor hood back here is what kind of keeps all of these muscles. So the lumbricals come up and help form it. And that's what keeps our fingers able to do fine motions of extension where I can extend one part of it and extend the back part of it. If I have a distal hood rupture out here where that end gets ruptured, then I'll be able to extend that finger, but this finger will get stuck and I'll get that kind of mallet finger look where the finger gets stuck like that. Focus camera, thank you. But whenever you hear of something called an extensor hood rupture, they're gonna mention whether it's a proximal extensor hood rupture or a distal extensor hood rupture. And that will then determine how bad they've lost either flexion or how bad they've lost extension of the finger. And then they can't do the red rump thing. So this is kind of a looking a little bit more in depth of that flexor hood. If you look at that, man, there's so much to that. Look at the way it kind of layers in here. You've got that deep transverse carp metacarpal ligament that comes up and forms it. Here's my interosseous muscle, right? Here's my lumbrical. They form kind of a, a wrap around. And there's my extensor digitorum, right? That goes all the way out here. And what that hood does is gives me a pulley system the whole way out my finger that allows me to extend back really fast. So when you really want to give somebody the middle finger, that extensor hood is helpful for doing it. So always thank your extensor hood. We also have three primary arches of the palm. We have our proximal carpal arch, distal carpal arch, and our longitudinal carpal arch. What does that look like? In our foot. In our foot, yeah. They're mirrors, yeah. Right? We have a distal, proximal, and longitudinal in our foot, too. Allows us to do things like cupping, right? Where we can do cupping on the patient or we beat on them. It also allows us to make that nice clap, right? And we used to know somebody could do that and actually do tones out of it. I don't know how they person did that, but they're more musical inclined than I am. Mr. With, Murphy, yes. I have a question on this picture. Yes. Um, if someone's thumb is like coming in toward the center of their hand, does it have to do with anything with the arch? It could. I mean, this it could be that the proximal arch is tight. Sure. But it, it could also be a contracture of the flexors or the opponent's policies as well. Okay. So if you like use your thumb a lot, it wouldn't really be related to the arches. It might be the muscles. It's typically the muscles, but again, it could be. Right. And that's why a lot of times, again, at the hand, just like the wrist, we're going to mobilize anyway. Okay. Because that way, because again, that those arches would technically be considered part of the hand capsule, if that makes sense. Okay. Because when we talk about the hand, we're not going to be like, oh, well, the carpal capsule versus the metacarpal capsule. We're just going to call it like the hand capsule, if that makes sense. Okay. There's way too tiny bones in there to get messing around with. But yeah, it could be. But it could also be that they've either A, got weakness of the muscles out here that they can't extend back, or these are tight. So that's gonna be one where we have to test, right? And do those dermatomes and myotomes. Hands are fun, I'm telling you. All right, the muscles of the hand, we have an anterior surface and a posterior surface. If they originate outside of the hand itself, what kind of muscles are they called again? Just like in the foot. Extrinsic, good, right? So these are all extrinsic muscles because they all originate up here in the arm. So are our FDS and our FDP, flexor super or superficialis and profundus because profundus is so profound. And then we also have our flexor pollicis longus that are on the anterior surface, right? The palmar surface of the arm. On the posterior surface, Guess what kind of muscles we're gonna find on the posterior surface? Quick, without guessing. Think we're gonna have extensors back there? Well, look at this, we're gonna have extensors back there. Amazing, right? And a little bit of abductor pollicis longus. So we have APL and EPL. 
which is that one group that tied into getting deep ravines, right? I don't remember how to spell, but dequir. We also have our extensor digitorum, our extensor indices. I have a thought. And our extensor digiti minimi. Hmm. One million dollars. All right. So if those are extrinsics, then the next thing we have are our intrinsics, our insider hand muscles. We have the muscles of the thenar and hypothenar eminence. I am not going to ask you to memorize these. You should already kind of know them because they would have been covered in anatomy, right? We have our flexor pollicis brevis, abductor pollicis brevis, and opponens pollicens. What I remembered about this is I have my three pollicis muscles on my thenar eminence. And I have my three minimi muscles over on my hypothenar eminence. They are all the same. It's my FAO muscles, flexor, abductor, opponents, flexor, abductor, opponents. Pollicis here, right? So I have pollicis, brevis, and brevis. Digity, 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 minimi, minimi, minimi. That was the way I remembered those for my boards is that whether it's my hypo or my thenar eminence, it's the FAOs, flexor, abductor, and opponents, and whether it's my pollicis or my minimi. The thenar eminence is this stuff here, this big fat area by my thumb. My hypo thenar eminence is this area over here by my pinky. And then the other thing I have are my lumbricals, 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 and my inner ossei. Right? So my lumbricals are those feathery muscles that kind of go along my tendons, right? So if this is my flexor side, right? I got my lumbricals out here, my flexor side. Deep to the lumbricals, I have my inner ossei, which are my muscles that run between my bones. All of those help form all of those tendinous junctions that go all the way out and form all those little pulley systems and everything out to the fingers. Right? Lumber goals are primarily responsible for making you make tabletop grip, right, 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 or duck grip. And our OCI help you with a lot of this motion, but the lumber goals do as well. So those are my intrinsic hand muscles. Um, I heard one of my students once tell me that when they were thinking about the thenar and hyperthenar eminence, and this is, you know, this is going to date me a little bit, like not as in, like, you know, date somebody, but as in put me old, is FAO was an old name of a toy company, FAO Schwartz. And you always wanted to hold toys in your hand. So that was her way of remembering it that, well, the FAOs are in my hand. I don't know if that worked for me. I just remember the initials. So with the hand, we have a bunch of, the functional positions kind of rest in here. Right? That's what we do a lot of our motions with when I'm grabbing a soda. I'm in functional position, right? We have all kinds of grips. We have a power grip for hammers or for carrying the sword of gray skull and being He-Man or She-Ra. We have precision grips, right? We have a bunch of different precision grips, right? A lot of those are going to be covered in 207 because we're going to work with them. And that's going to be some of the exercise we do where we have people pick stuff up with two fingers two fingers and pull out on putty, right? So we might give them putty where they pull on the putty. And then we might work three fingers together, four fingers together, five fingers together, pulling on the putty, right? We might work on them doing hammer stuff where they're working the hammer back and forth, doing power grip. Again, pathology, we covered most of them with wrist fractures, dequir veins, dupatrins. The main thing for me is remembering this sensory distribution for the median nerve, the ulnar nerve, and I'm going to add one more now onto it, and that's the radial nerve. The radial nerve is the back side of your hand, primarily digits one. So back here, primarily digits one, two, three, and some of four, but not a lot of it. So this area back here on the back side of my hand is radial, right? 
median ulnar. Why is that important? Well, that's going to help us determine if they've got a pinch somewhere, right? So I may ask you, what could be a question I could ask you on that is I could say something to the effect of, your patient has paresthesia, pins and needles, of their first, second, and third finger on their palmar side. What nerve distribution does that coincide with? So first, second, third, on palmar side, that is my median, good, right? If I said the same thing, but said my dorsal side, that would be my radial. And then pretty much ulnar is everything else. Ulnar is pretty much the ulnar's whole ulnar side of my hand. I always think that the, the radial, nerve, radial nerve primarily does a lot of my thumb muscles on the outside, so it relates to that decor veins. Open positions. Open packed is just slight flexion. This is an open packed position. Closed packed, well, it's full flexion, closed, and full opposition of thumb. Fist is my closed packed position. It makes sense. Capsular patterns, you lose all motion. Here are your range of motions that you have to kind of study. Again, do not study these. There will be a code for the final. Yes, Sydney. Do not study these. These are there for your knowledge so that if you need to look them up for like a question from your CIs or something like that, you have them, but do not get lost in the minutia of knowing that finger MCP flexion is 61 degrees for functional motion. Don't do that you will lose your mind. Here's what everyone wanted to see. There is no goniometry or manual muscle testing required for the hand, the fingers primarily. Well, why is that? Because again, that's gonna get more down into specialist type stuff. Yay. I can at least give you one piece of good news. That's it. That's the hand, wrist and elbow. That is Benito for that. Yes. I have a quick question when it comes to uh, like cysts in the wrist. Yes, like ganglion cysts and stuff like that. I think so. They would be on the posterior side. Oh, posterior side. Okay. Yep. Um, what kind of block would that be if like we were doing range of motion on the wrist? What could happen? So if I've got a posterior kind of a ganglion cyst on either a tendon or a nerve, even right. Oh. So ganglion just means kind of growing up is what it means, right? Think about it. if I've got a swelling back here, what's that gonna limit me in? Extension. It's gonna limit my extension, but it's also gonna partially limit my flexion because what's that doing to all those tendons? It's gonna kind of like block it. It's gonna kind of block it, yeah. So you're gonna lose, a, your primarily motion you're gonna lose is extension because it's gonna yeah. kind of pinch off and not let you go back, right? Mm -hmm. But you'll also lose a little bit of flexion. You'll have most of it. Right, a lot of times what you'll see is they'll have functional finger motion, but they'll lose some wrist flexion. Because okay. usually when I get my, the ganglions, and it, whether it's a ganglion cyst, the, the palmar side or the dorsal side, it's usually right kind of at the wrist itself. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. And again, we have to determine at that point, the PT does, is it a ganglion cyst that's nerve related or is it inflammation related? Right, because inflammation we could treat. If it's nerve related, we might not be able to do much about it. Okay, well, if it's like nerve, does it mean like it comes, like it comes and goes or? And yeah, a lot of times I've seen that, especially the palmar. I haven't seen too much of the back, but I've seen it of the, the median nerve where you'll get ballooning of the median nerve, which is like cysts. Okay. And then it kind of swells down and then it comes back and it's a lot of from repetitive motion. Oh, okay. Because I, I was just curious because on, um, my left wrist on the posterior side, sometimes I will like, I don't know, I can't totally flex compared to my right. So okay. I, I didn't know if it was like something I should be concerned about. <laughs> well, I mean, here's the deal. Is it impairing your ability to do stuff? It doesn't, but some days like I don't, I can't like work out because of it. Okay. And probably that tells you that what probably flared it up. I <laughs> am working out. <laughs> uh -uh. It's funny how that happens, right? I don't get why it's only my left one, though. Well, are you right hand dominant? Yeah. Okay. So which hand's going to be stronger? My, 
right? It's the right one that you use more frequently. Okay. Like think about it, when you're writing, you're using this hand, so you're doing a lot of extension flexion. So all those muscles are used to that. This hand's not used to that kind of crap. Oh. This hand just kind of hangs around. Okay. So maybe strengthen this hand a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? I'm gonna stop the recording.